Welcome to A Healthy Curiosity, the podcast that explores what it takes to be well in a busy world with self-care strategies from Chinese medicine. I'm your host, Brody Welch, here to support you on your journey of health, happiness, and personal evolution. Welcome to today's show. I'm your host, Brody Welch. And with me today is a kind of kindred spirit who I had the pleasure of meeting at a conference way back in 2014, before I had any inkling that I was going to have a podcast and before she had any inkling that she was going to have a podcast. And we connected. And over the years, I've been on her show a couple of times. We've kept in touch. And we have a lot in common in the sense that we work with women who want to show up in the world as healthy and fit and confident and really embrace their inner strength at any age. Courtney Townley has been working in the fitness and wellness industries for over 20 years. She has a bunch of certifications as a Stott Pilates instructor, as a national strength and conditioning personal trainer, a precision nutrition level two coach, and is a student of the Ida portal method. She is passionate about a multidimensional approach to health and fitness and uses habit-based coaching principles to help women tap into their prime at any age. And she works with women all over the world to build healthier lives with more ease through her online coaching business, Grace and Grit, which is also the name of her excellent podcast. Courtney, welcome to A Healthy Curiosity. I'm so glad you're here. I am so excited to be here. I feel exactly the same way. You're a kindred spirit. I respect you and your work so much. And I'm just honored to be here. Well, it's really fun to be having a conversation with someone who has a different background from me, but is doing similar work, like leading people through really helping them step into the person that they want to be and coming at it from this notion that it's the things that we do every day that multiply out over time that give us the results that we want. And when we were talking about what this interview might look like, we were kind of all over the place with it. But the first thing that you said that I thought was was really fun is talking about discipline and how to love it. Because a lot of people feel like, well, that's just all they need is more discipline or more willpower, and then they'd be successful. Let's talk about what's problematic about that. Well, I think for a lot of people, discipline is a dirty word. You know, <laughs> they mm-hmm. hear that word and they literally have a visceral sort of response. Like, um, who wants that? Yeah. And we think of discipline as our parents disciplining us or being in trouble, or it's kind of almost an outside act, right? It's something that is coming at us. And, and the discipline that I refer to and I speak of is really self directed, it's self discipline. And self discipline, I will tell you, I have seen women use absolutely to the point of self-destruction, right? We can take it too far as we can take anything too far. But when self-discipline comes out of a place of self-respect, it's a very different kind of discipline. We're taking daily actions regardless of how we feel about them because we know they are honoring the kind of person we want to be in the world. That's the kind of discipline I promote and I encourage. So it sounds like that kind of discipline is like, if there's always this tension between our present self and our future self, it sounds like essentially like those small actions every day that take you from present self to future self. That's what discipline is, is being committed to your future self. Absolutely. I think it's having some sense of who who that future self is and knowing that being our best isn't always the easy route, right? We're going to have to do some things that aren't necessarily super fun to do (laughs) every day. But, you know, I I say to my clients a lot, it's funny when I think about paying the bills, I don't like paying my bills. I don't, that's a discipline, but I do love having running water and I like having a roof over my head. Oh, those things rock, right? (laughs) Rock. And, and so it's really the byproduct of discipline that, that I love so much. And I think sometimes we can lose sight of that because we become so hyper-focused on the disciplined action that we just don't want to do. And it seems like just with that analogy that basically if you're constantly in resistance to paying your bills, it becomes so much more miserable versus if you just decide this is just what I'm doing so that I can have these things that I appreciate and that make my life easier, like the roof over my head and running water. When you drop the resistance, it's just a fact of life. You accept it. You do it without even thinking about it. 
It's so true. And yet I think you bring up a great point, like this whole conversation of resistance, because resistance is no small thing. <laughs> I mean, we can marinate it in it for days and weeks and months and even years. The thing that I have learned in my own life and that I absolutely practice a lot with my clients is when we are facing resistance on any level, if we can identify just the next super simple, small step to at least lean into that resistance a tiny bit, it's amazing how much it softens the resistance. So for example, again, I'll use the bills. You know, I don't love paying bills. I really, there was a time in my life, I would let all of the envelopes stack up in a pile on my desk for weeks. And I was terrified about opening them and looking at where I actually stood financially. But over time, I realized, well, that was never going to get me anywhere. I was just going to continuously have this fear of money and fear of paying bills and not having enough. And so just asking myself, okay, what's the next just super small thing I can do to tackle this project? I could just organize the envelopes on my desk and get my checkbook out and just sit there and see what happens. And you know what? When I sit there to see what happens, then I want to open the envelopes. And then I want to get out my checkbook and actually pay some of those bills. And it's like one action just starts to compound into the next and the next and the next. And then the funniest part is that I'm done in 20 minutes and it was so easy. So if I'm hearing you correctly, you lure yourself to the table to pay the bills with the promise that you only have to just go sit at the table. Exactly. Right. So that's the kind of, um, I love the James Clear's tiny habits thing. You know, like, I mean, an example I use in my coaching group is like the floss one tooth, do one push up. you know, like (laughs) if you're just doing that, it's like, you might as well do more. (laughs) Well, once you're in, I think motion creates momentum. And I think that when you take that first step, that second step becomes easier. The third is even easier. And then all of a sudden, before you know it, you're kind of at this nice canter, you know? Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. And I still do that with meditation sometimes. It's like that I have a commitment to every day sit down and do some amount of meditation. And that can scale to be a longer practice if I have a lot of time or a shorter practice if I'm running late. But just the fact that I go there every day. And that's my commitment is to just sit and take one conscious breath. I'll inevitably get into it. I'll inevitably be like, oh yeah, right. This feels great. (laughs) I like it here. It's so true. And I think that we create so much overwhelm for ourselves because we look at the monumentalness of the task, right? And how big and scary and insurmountable it can be. And then we just marinate in the fear and the resistance of it to the point that we're paralyzed and we never take action. I always tell people, what's just that the smallest possible step you could take today? Maybe that's just making a phone call. Maybe it's taking something out of the refrigerator. You know, maybe it's going for a five minute walk, but how can we simplify it so much that it's almost impossible to rationalize your way out of it? Yeah, exactly. And I have my people, we have a a habit commitment chart and we all commit to the one small doable step that we're going to do that week. And we're, that we're going to shoot for it. And so it's like having a very clear sense of what this is, because it's like that, that every day, if you put a piece of paper under your feet every day, you don't notice much until the end of the year when you're like, you know, four inches taller because you're, <laughs> you've been doing all those paper stacking and it's the slow changes over time. That's like, you don't feel like you're making any progress until you, a long enough time goes by and then you can look back and go, oh, wow. Right. All that, that actually mattered that added up to something. It's so true. One of the first um, habits I teach clients when they start working with me, which is, I mean, really irritating for some people is the first two weeks they're focusing on one five minute action step done consistently every day. And, you know, they get to pick the action step. I'm not even telling them what that action step needs to be. But the idea is that we know that big change really is built off of those small, seemingly insignificant things we're doing every single day, day in and day out. A five-minute action done over the course of 14 days can actually add up to a lot of progress. And what it really does is it starts to empower people. People start feeling better that they're actually being consistent about something and showing up and following through. And then they're ready for some bigger tasks. But the five minute action, I think, or like your example of just the one small habit for the week, I think those are incredibly powerful. I think that some of the power there lies in the fact that we think about ourselves 
we have these labels that that we limit ourselves with, right? That you can say like, oh, I'm not a singer or I'm not an artist or I'm not a dancer or I'm not an athlete or I'm, you know, like I'm not one of these health nuts who does X, Y, and Z in their, in their kitchen. So if you limited your identity, if you've drawn a line of like, this is something that I am and this other thing is something that I'm not, you break that down, right? Like if you're quote unquote, not a singer, but you spend five minutes a day singing. Well, after the end of two weeks, you're a singer. You're someone who sings for five minutes a day. And you've proven that to yourself that you are that. Yeah. And what you're speaking to is you're building a practice, right? I mean, that's what that five minutes is. You're building a practice of showing up for that thing. One of my mentors, Ido Portal, he, in one of my trainings one day, he said, you know, there's no such thing as lack of coordination because how many people do we hear use that as an excuse for not doing some things that they've always wanted to do? I'm just not coordinated. And he says, there's no such thing as lack of coordination. There's only lack of education. That makes so much sense from what we know about the brain, for example, you know, and like muscle memory. It's like all it is, it's neurons wiring together and firing together to a point that it becomes automatic and overlearned. And it's like, yeah, if you can have a natural proclivity to that or you can develop it. And it's it's the kind of thing where it just takes repetition. Exactly. It's reps, 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 right? (laughs) Mm -hmm. And with those reps comes an identity shift, right? It's inevitable that when you do things differently, that then suddenly you have developed a new skill. Suddenly that is something that, that shapes you and something that you can identify with. I love that you're bringing that up because I think a lot of people, especially like in the health world, right. Of trying to improve health or improve fitness level or become, you know, better at meditating, a lot of us, you know, we let our beliefs get in the way because we we think that we have to change our belief system before we can act differently, but it's actually the reverse. We have to act consistently differently to prove to ourselves that there's a different reality on the other side. And that's where our belief system changes. Action is so, so powerful. And action is really the precursor to motivation and changing our beliefs. Action is the precursor to motivation? Yes. I think so. I think so many people wait for motivation, right? We wait for motivation. Yes. I still feel motivated yet. Right. You know, or I'm waiting to feel motivated or I just don't have motivation. My next question, of course, always is, well, what actions are you taking right now around that thing? Because I guarantee if you start taking some small steps, you're going to start feeling more motivated. It feels more achievable or more doable. It feels more doable. But I also think, again, action creates that momentum. It yes, just starts- exactly you know, making us feel like it's possible and that we aren't paralyzed anymore and that we aren't lazy or all these other identities we, Mm -hmm. we tend to take on. And so, yeah, I'm a big believer that action precedes motivation. I tend to think of it the other way around in the sense that we have to know what we're aiming at, you know, like that we have to know why it matters to us, you know? And so identifying the why is like, to me, that's identifying what's motivating us And then from the why we get, okay, well, what are the actions that are going to take me there? And then we start putting it into place. It gets so convoluted, I think, because I'm, I'm, I believe with you. I mean, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly that we have to know our why we have to know what we're headed for. But even when we know that there's going to be days we wake up where we feel unmotivated, right? It's just not enough. Right. Or profoundly scared, right? You know, like scared or rebellious, like, or, you know, and, and those things can come up for people, even if it's fundamentally against the thing that they are trying to create for themselves. They're finding themselves doing actions that are taking them in exactly the polar opposite direction from where they want to be headed. And I find that to be the fascinating ground for exploration. Like what is coming up in those moments? Well, who's driving the bus when yes. you're, when you are <laughs> acting in such a way that is like totally against your professed goal or thing that you're wanting for yourself? How do you engage that with your clients when they're, they say that, okay, I want to, I want to drop 10 pounds. I want to become more fit. I want to eat healthier. And they find themselves in the kitchen, you know, like at nine o'clock at night at the bottom of a pint of Ben and Jerry's or like not going to the gym or like what kinds of self-exploration do you encourage when people are in the midst of, of self-sabotaging behavior? So I typically do an exercise we call breaking the chain where I try to look back at like the past 24 to 48 hours to just see the pattern of what has been going on, because that can tell us a lot about what led up to that moment. 
because a lot of us get caught in that moment saying, oh, I'm just so weak. I ate this whole pint of Ben and Jerry's ice cream. But what they aren't considering is that they had a really stressful day. They haven't eaten in seven hours and they're on total decision overload. And then Ben and Jerry's, when they opened the freezer, was staring at them. And so, of course, it makes so much sense to consume that in that moment. Yeah. But I think just bringing a client's attention to what led up to that moment can actually help them to prevent it from happening again in the future, or at least less often, because they just start to become aware that, oh, wow, you know, last time I didn't get enough sleep, my eating was really all over the place the next day, and I just felt exhausted, and I wasn't making great decisions. And so they start linking certain behaviors with others, and that really changes a lot of behavior. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think that it's so much more kind to ourselves to examine the triggers and the circumstances by which we were not in alignment with our best intentions rather than just beating ourselves up for not being quote unquote perfect or you know or being weak or lazy or whatever we're judging ourselves to be it's like rather than just slapping your hand away from the pint of ben and jerry's it's like oh well let's look at what's happening and let's see if we can shed some light of awareness on what's going on so that we can maybe figure out how to do things differently next time And there's some really interesting studies that show that when we aren't very nice to ourselves, when we mess up, when we don't extend compassion and we just do fall into that pattern of being very judgmental and almost cruel to ourselves, that we actually will sabotage our behavior even more. So it's not helping, it's actually making it worse. (laughs) Yeah. Are are you, I, I, I was familiar with that from Kristen Neff's work that she talks about, like that study of that basically that that self compassion is a more efficacious path to getting back on track than beating yourself up. It really is, absolutely. And it's funny because when you when I introduce that to clients, you know, they they almost have a hard time believing that <laughs> because <laughs> because their reality of how they've treated themselves has been so different for so many years and even decades. But when you ask them how has that really worked out for you, it's pretty clear that it hasn't. In a culture that glorifies busyness, it's easy to overextend ourselves, making the days longer by making the nights shorter, working through lunch, blowing off exercise, beating ourselves up for not meeting our own impossibly high standards. It can be really easy not to notice that comfort behaviors like numbing out with Netflix and a bag of chips have become regular substitutes for feeling connected to ourselves, loved ones, our intuition, and creativity until you realize that you're not in the body that you want. You're not experiencing the joy that you want, but that you don't know quite how to break out of the cycle. It's time to put yourself at the top of your own to-do list and start embodying self-respect. What might that look like? You'd get enough rest. Eat, move, breathe, and connect in ways that honor your being, not just your doing. You'd set boundaries to have more time for what matters most. You'd feel less stressed, more calm, and confident. You'd feel lighter and more comfortable in your body, And leading by example, you'd help everyone around you do the same. That's how we roll in my Level Up group. See, I believe that you have the right to take care of yourself, even before all the work is done, and that when you do, you get more done in less time and are able to show up for the people that you love with kindness and patience. I'm looking for five people who are ready to start practicing self-respect this September in the next round of Level Up. It's hard to go against the grain of an entire culture by yourself and way easier in community. If you're ready to start honoring your being, visit the Level Up page at brodywelch.com and schedule a discovery call with me. If it's a good fit, I'll invite you to join this life-changing community. That's Brody with an IE, Welch with a CH, and hop on my calendar. Now back to the show. And that actually kind of gets us back to where we started about discipline. I like this model of instead of thinking of ourselves as these children who need to be disciplined by an inner parent all the time, that instead it's kind of like a supportive boss who wants to motivate a team, right? That we have these different parts of ourselves, like where the the present moment self is like, I had a really tough day and I just want to veg out and eat ice cream. And, (laughs) And then, and there's like, maybe like the boss role of being like, okay, yeah, except that you don't want to feel like crap tomorrow and you want to stay on this trajectory of being clear-headed in the morning and on your weight loss track and all the other reasons why that's a bad idea. So like, what could work for you 
person of the present. What could work for you in terms of feeling better in a way that's not going to totally destroy the team and like take us down and having that compassionate invitation to bring the different competing wants and needs of the present and future selves both to the table to figure out maybe a different way of acting that rather than just being like a top-down authoritarian inner parent that's disciplining an inner child that might then rebel and (laughs) and wreak havoc for the long term. I think it really comes down to just awareness of all those parts of yourself. And it also comes down to normalizing the conversation that everyone goes through this. You know, it's not it's not you that has all these challenging parts to yourself. We all struggle. This is humanity. And I think this is why your podcast is so genius and my podcast is helping on the same level in the sense that we are normalizing these conversations that we all go through this. And really awareness is a very, very big deal. And the older I get, the more I realize that. It's just noticing what's going on and naming it without judging it. That's why I feel like meditation is such a critical skill Mm. for us to develop is because meditation is like where we build the muscle of awareness that can then serve us in breaking any pattern that we have. Do you teach meditation in your course? I teach meditation on a very remedial level in the sense that we do body scans, Mm -hmm. you know, just going through naming and noticing what people are feeling in their body. I encourage a lot of meditation. I do not consider myself like a master meditation teacher or anything like that. So I do introduce the concepts and I definitely, you know, encourage people to, to build a practice around it. Body scans alone can be super powerful. Amazing. Amazing because they, they require that people pause first and foremost. And yes. you know, in, in the fast and furious culture of today's world, that's not mm-hmm. such a simple thing to do. Not at all. So it first requires that we pause. And then, you know, you can do a body scan in like 20 seconds, you know, just quickly noticing what your body is feeling, naming it. And then maybe even honoring it, maybe even in some way, like if you have to pee, go to the bathroom. You know? Exactly. That's one of one of the causes of diseases. And according to Ayurveda is overriding natural urges. And so if you're so checked out of your body that you don't even notice that you're dehydrated or have to pee or like are tired and need sleep, it's like, how can you possibly honor that? Pausing and just getting in the habit of checking in with yourself, I think also helps to break down that, that mind-body dichotomy where we're just like, again, like the body is protesting in various ways. And the mind is like, you don't matter. What matters is this thing I have to do. And like every time we override the body giving us a clue as to like what it might need, it's a form of disempowerment and disrespect. Absolutely. I don't know. Do you ever, I don't know if you've ever done the the Deepak and Oprah 21 day challenges that they do the meditation challenges. I'm familiar with them. Okay. Well, I've done several of them. And the one they're doing right now is um, losing the weight. And obviously speaking in metaphor, right? It's not just body weight, but the weight of your life. But one of the things that Deepak mentioned the other day that I thought was so awesome, he said that we are the healer and the healed. We are both, but we can't be the healer if we aren't listening to what needs to be healed. Again, it comes back to that awareness piece that we can only heal ourselves when we're willing to slow down notice what's going on, and then make some conscious choices based on that information. Slowing down is so key, right? In Taoism, which is one of the major influences on Chinese medicine, there is this notion of wu wei or effortless action or right action in the moment is another way of thinking about it. And it's the kind of thing where like every moment calls for something different. And you can't really know what that is if you're not present for this moment, if you're still on autopilot of how you navigated something like this in the past. And so really like practicing getting present helps us figure out how to navigate this moment with as much awareness and wisdom as we possibly can. It's so true. And it is, it is such a practice that I truly wish was really taught in every school because how much pain would we save people later in life if they learned that in elementary school, in junior high? Exactly. How to get present, how to take care of our bodies, how to do a body scan. These things kindergartners could wrap their heads around, I think. Even intuitive eating. Like I think that if we could teach our children how to have a better relationship with food by teaching them some skills from intuitive eating, I think that that would prevent so many problems down the road. 
I couldn't agree more. That's it. Yes. And teaching them they can really trust their body's wisdom and that they don't need marketing claims or to seek out various nutrients that happen to be fashionable at the time. I know. It's so hard. We're in the um in the Grace and Grit podcast right now. We're doing a whole theme on the death of dieting. And I invited Tracy Mann. She is a psychologist who specifically studies dieting and eating behavior. And she has an eating lab at the University of Minnesota where they've conducted a ton of research on dieting. And really all things point to dieting not working. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so many reasons. But anyway, it was a very compelling conversation. And the thing, the antidote to dieting is, of course, having a relationship with food ongoing that is sustainable, that's lifestyle. Absolutely. And, and, and you know, diets to me are largely somebody else dictating what is best for your life and what is best for your body. And it actually removes the wisdom and the relationship with our body. I think it sort of separates us from what is best for us because we're just listening to these outside nuggets and not really considering what our body is saying in response to that, or if it even feels right to us. Well, which makes so much sense when it's so confusing. There's a 10,000 diets out there and it's like that desire for just tell me what to do. Yeah. Like, okay, I'm going to pick you and I'm going to just follow you as opposed to, I'm going to understand, I feel like I'm, I'm going to develop that, that relationship within. Also, it's the kind of thing that changes over time, right? Like we all know that metabolism slows down as we age, but that there is in Chinese medicine, we see digestion is so central and our digestive fire also tends to wane as we age. And so we need to do our best to keep it stoked so that it can continue to do its job. But listening to the wisdom of what is now and what as the demands of whatever we're doing in our lifestyle change, that our food and what is good for us may also be changing. And that's it's not a one and done solution that you can't just figure it out once and for all it's an ongoing conversation, right? It's something that we have mm -hmm. to be engaged with for the rest of our life. And that's why I talk to my clients so much about finding the joy in discipline, finding yes. the joy in the discipline of taking care of yourself because it's never going to stop. Like if you yeah. really want to live in a healthy space and a healthy body, you got to pay attention pretty much all the time. <laughs> Exactly. And and that includes paying attention to, I mean, like, I also don't think it has to be complicated. It's like, no, for, you know, no. just like, yeah. just like first and foremost, like don't eat the artificial crap, you right. know, like secondly, eat what you can digest. Thirdly, eat with the seasons, what's local um, and organic when possible. Warm cooked, simple food tends to digest best. And, and beyond that, it's like what- Drink so, some water. Yeah, exactly. Right. Sleep. Stay hydrated, <laughs> get some sleep, have a good relationship with your emotions. Yeah. And have a, have a belief system where you're not seeing emergencies around every corner. Like these are, these are basics. And I so appreciate just your highlighting that because again, I feel like the more sort of the more educated I get, the older I get, the more responsibilities in my life I have. I just feel like my saving grace is constantly coming back to the basics with self-care, with relationships, with everything. It's about coming back to the basics and asking myself, Am I truly doing these things? And where can I do just a little bit better? Not 100% better, but maybe just 1% better tomorrow. Yeah. And 1% better tomorrow adds up exponentially over time, just like yeah. contributing to your, your retirement account, right? Like it's the power of compound habits that give us that exponential growth over time. Absolutely. The other thing that we were chatting about before turning on the recording is this notion of, and that sort of ties in with that, like being present for our lives and coming back to the basics is that every phase of life looks a little different. And in Chinese medicine, we think about the cycles of seven and eight, which like every seven years for women, your jing, your your vital essence unfolds a little bit differently. So that sometimes those seven year shifts are really obvious, like the difference between, well, like age 14 going through puberty or age 49 going through menopause, but also age 35 when progesterone drops off like crazy and it just, it, or, or we can think about it about just the different phases of life when, for example, oh yeah, when I was in this relationship or when I had this job or when I lived in this place, that my life was like this. And so as we move forwards in life, as we're in 40, 50, 60, as we're kind of in midlife, there is this temptation to want to go backwards to something that was when we were like 18 or 20 that really doesn't work. And I'm, I'm wondering like just what your thoughts on are 
about how we stay current with our current reality and what you think about aging in general and what that means for our self-care. I think that you are absolutely spot on by saying that we are evolving, right? And as we age, self-care looks different. It's not always going to look the same. I mean, when I think about how I cared for myself in my 20s versus my 30s versus my 40s, so radically different in many ways because my responsibility shifted and my chemistry shifted, my perception of health and my definition of health shifted. Yes. And so I had to honor those things. And again, I think it really comes down to inner work. I think when you're very aware of who you are and you're aware of what is nourishing you or depleting you, you're in a much better position to make choices to move in a healthy direction. But again, if we're just filling our life up with so much busyness and so much activity that we're never willing to do that in our work. I think that's where a lot of problems arise. And and I have to say that I do largely work with women. In fact, I only work with women and I largely work with the population. I would say 35 to 65, although there's outliers, but that's kind of the crux of the, the category I work with. And I see a lot of women 40 plus trying to chase their 25, 30 year old bodies, right? They're trying to get back the body they had at that age. And it's interesting because when I ask them what their priorities were when they were 20 or 30, their priorities were very different than they are now at 40 or 50 or 60. And so I sometimes feel like their wishes and their actions are misaligned with their current day priorities. And that's creating a lot of conflict. And I also think that we rob ourselves of the joy and the possibility in our older years by constantly looking back. Absolutely. Like I, in my personal life, I've never been in better shape than I am now in my forties, like including, I was always an athlete. I was always super strong, but it's like, just that I've learned so much about how to take care of myself. And part of that involves some grieving, like the loss of having to cut back in certain regards, you know, like, and to that part of me can miss the intensity, but I know that it isn't as balancing for me. And I see people actually like getting, as an acupuncturist, I see people getting injured all the time, trying to hold themselves to the same standards that 20 years ago might have been appropriate, Um, which isn't to say that that we're destined to weaken and shrivel as we age. It's like that I I believe that you can be healthy and strong in in any age, but it just requires being more considerate and kind to the body that we currently have to be able to know what's good for it. And being brutally honest with yourself, right? About what really is working for you and what isn't. Because when I was growing up, there was kind of that opportunity to compare myself to magazines or certain people on TV. But now I feel like people are competing with the whole world thanks to social media. So it's constantly being shoved in our face what we can compete with or the ideal bodies we should be striving for. It's exhausting. We do have a responsibility to ourselves if we truly want deep health to be really careful what we're consuming on all levels. Really, really such a good point because yeah. like it's insidious, right? How that can oh. get behind your lens of, of perspective. And what you were saying earlier about that question of values and are our actions aligned with those values? Because it's really like we determine our own lives and what we're going to stand for and who, and who we are going to be. And if we're living in alignment with our actions and our values, we are being the best version of us that we can possibly be. And it's the kind of thing where like if the things that we don't actually value, if you don't actually deeply, if it's not your dream to look like a fashion model, you know, like at 70, then maybe it's okay that you focus on your spirituality or how much you're loving people or how much service you're providing to the world, or just like that there's so many other things that might be more true for you and recognizing that not paying attention to what everyone thinks you should be paying attention to, or having the guts to, to really opt out of that chasing the 20 something body or whatever, that, that, that actually is taking a stand for yourself and honoring your integrity when you're living according to your own values. It's so true. I love it. Every time you say that the opting out of stress, you know, that that, I just love that phrase that you use all the time. It's such a good one, but yeah, I, I, I think that we have to pay attention. We have to pay attention on so many levels. And I think that above all is a practice that everyone could be doing more of, you know, as when we talk about health, I just feel like 
I think sometimes we think, well, if I practice something enough, I'm Mm -hmm. just not going to have to focus on it anymore. And I think, you know, I've been drinking water my whole life. (laughs) (laughs) Probably in my twenties, I became very aware of how important water is. And yet here I am at 41 and I still have days or weeks where I don't really drink enough water. Right. And so I have to constantly refocus. And that's the beauty of meditation. It's a practice in refocusing. Absolutely. So you, you describe yourself as not like an expert meditator, uh, uh, but at the same time, you certainly are someone who's developed quite a lot of self awareness. And I'm wondering if you have a favorite practice that you'd like to share with us. Favorite practice? I would say one of the most profound practices in my life is just my morning time. I feel like it's kind of cliche. Now I see everyone kind of talking about morning routines and morning, but really this for me has been probably for the last decade of my life, a game changer because I wake up and nobody else in my house is up. And so I have that space to just be with myself and I wash my face. I go to the bathroom. I turn the coffee pot on if I'm drinking coffee or tea, if I'm drinking tea, and then I go and sit on the couch and I do my meditation And then I read and then I do a little bit of writing and then I do my movement. I move my body. And that is really in the span of, I'd probably say it takes like now it's evolved to about an hour and a half. And I realize not everyone has that kind of time, but again, this was a decade in the making. And I will tell you, there is such a radical difference on the days that I do it versus the days I don't. Because n- not every day is it possible. Some days I do let myself sleep in. Some days my son wakes up sick. I mean, it's not always possible, but it is so evident to me how powerful the practice is. First of all, just want to all, all of my level up people out there. Uh, we didn't actually script this part of the conversation. I didn't oh. know that this is something that Courtney advocates because we spend fully half the course developing a morning routine. Yeah. And and it's like it's it may be cliche, but it's like it's popular because it it works. It it's, works. It's it's effective, and you can't argue with the fact that if you start your day in alignment with what matters most to you, you're not going to spend the day reacting to the world. But if you prime those muscles of meditation and awareness, you're going to be more aware of your actions throughout the day. If you start your day by moving your body and oxygenating your blood, you're going to have the energy to handle what comes at you and you're going to be tapped into your body's wisdom. And as you nourish yourself and get in touch with what's going on in your mind and like journaling or like just tapping into your subconscious, you have so much more self-awareness that can guide you throughout your day. So thanks for sharing that, Courtney, and, and kind of a fun little little thing to discover yet another parallel in, <laughs> in, the, in the work that we do. Because I also work with women ages 35 to 65 yeah, right? with some outliers. Yeah, it's really, um, yeah, it's, it's really fun. You know, what's interesting too, is I feel like when I train in the morning, when I, when I move my body and work out in the morning, I really get so many of my most creative ideas yeah. and I am able to process business in a way that I don't do when I sit at my desk. I'm kind of killing two birds with one stone. I mean, I'm, I'm moving my body and getting all this benefit of training, but I also am really stimulating my brain, organizing my day and really kind of being in a creative space. Exactly. Because it really is a myth that our best ideas come to us while sitting at our desk. It's like, it's, it's those eureka moments of being in the bathtub and having this scientific discovery or having the breakthrough that happens when you stop and just go enjoy life. Because that's really like, it gives that the brain needs to go into that yin mode to make those connections, everything like that. Courtney, I feel like I could talk to you all day, but we are both busy people. And unfortunately (laughs) that cannot happen. So could you give us a sense of where people can get in touch with you or um, follow you if they're interested? Yeah. I always say, you know, that the best stomping ground for my work is on my website, graceandgrit.com and the podcast, which is the Grace and Grit podcast. And yeah, I'm on social media platforms, Instagram and Facebook. And um, my email is Courtney at graceandgrit.com. But yeah, the website is just kind of a one-stop shop for all of those links. Fabulous. This has been such a blast. It's great to talk with you and I really appreciate your time. Oh, you too, Brody. Yeah. Keep up the great work. Thanks for listening today. For more episodes of A Healthy Curiosity, you can visit the iTunes store. If you appreciated today's show, please leave us a review. This helps other people to find the podcast. You can also head to brodywelch.com where you can find free self-care resources, learn more about Chinese medicine, and let me know what you'd like to hear about on future episodes. I'd love to hear from you. 
Until next time, be good to yourself. 